It's not that I have uh, any sort of death wish at all. In fact, I guess uh, an out-of-body uh, experience, if you will. I can't imagine doing anything more exciting or meaningful uh, with my life right now. The engine's throttling down now. I love to fly. Uh, I love to travel, and uh, probably my favorite uh, outdoor activity is rock climbing and mountaineering. He always has to ha have some sort of adventure brewing. That's just what makes him happy. I saw on my uh, 24th birthday this little flyer around the Stanford campus uh, advertising a tryout for the luge team. Uh, I loved it. I was hooked immediately. Right before the 88 Winter Olympics, I competed in the, uh, the Olympic trials and didn't quite make the, uh, the U.S. team, but was fortunate enough to uh, serve as a coach. And I uh, went to Calgary, lived in the Olympic Village, marched in opening ceremonies the whole nine yards. It was a you know, once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Well, I met Scott on a, a blind date. We were both living in um, Colorado. Actually, I called my mom when I first met him, and I said, you're not going to believe who I met last night. I met this guy who wants to be an astronaut. And she said, oh, you go on the funniest dates, you know? <laughs> I've been aspiring to become an astronaut and fly in space ever since I was uh, five years old, ever since I could walk and talk. My father was in the Air Force and then uh, started working with the Boeing Airplane Company uh, after that. And when I was young, I had uh, model rockets and posters on the wall. The photograph you see behind me here, it's a photograph of the summit of Mount Everest. And it's a very special place in, in my life. It's a place of uh, boyhood dreams and, and aspirations. I uh, was once a, an expedition team member of a British medical group that was going to go climb Mount Everest in 94. And uh, I ended up getting a better offer from NASA. The flight crew operations director at Don Putty gave me a call and uh, he said, hey, how'd you like to come on down to Houston and work with us? After I hung up the phone, I hooted and hollered. You know, people you know, from a mile around can probably hear me uh, screaming. You are accepted into the program as an astronaut candidate and uh, they describe it as you know, drinking out of a fire hose. You learn all the sciences of space, uh, oceanography, meteorology, life sciences, material science. Uh, if you aren't a pilot, prior to becoming an astronaut, you learn how to fly. Uh, once you get selected to a flight, then it's a different focus. Your focus becomes your crew, your mission, and the nine months ahead leading up to it. I pretty much lived with Scott as we were training for our STS-100 shuttle mission. You grow as a family, and you know, I spend more time with Scott than I did my wife and daughter during that time frame. When he's at work, he's the, an astronaut. When he's home, he's just a dad. I. Unfortunately, I have to say goodbye to them about a week before launch. We go into quarantine, we tell each other that we love each other, and uh, I'll be back in a couple weeks. Um, you know, it, it's, it's not really a game anymore. About nine minutes before launch, the whole tone of the crew changes, so you start to get your game face on. It's always been really launch is really just the, the time that you just, everything runs through your mind of what can happen. You know, riding on a rocket ship is uh, inherently a dangerous thing. And it's amazing, but the, the, the shuttle weighs about four and a half million pounds. We have seven million pounds of thrust. And when the solid booster's light, it's like a kick in the pants. There's some vibration, a little bit of noise, but then at T0, when the two solid rocket boosters of the orbiter uh, light off, there's no mistaking it, you're leaving town in a hurry. So at that point I was, oh my gosh, this is really happening and why did I let him do this? There's acceleration, adrenaline, vibration, noise, and uh, it's a time where you also have to focus very intently on the displays in front of you. The dream of my lifetime to go outside on my very first spacewalk, I've never felt so alive as when I've been outside doing a spacewalk. Yeah, it's a, uh, a totally different way of working and living in space. Because of my Russian language background and, and his excellent English, I went out on my very first spacewalk with a Russian cosmonaut, uh, Vladimir Titov. This is not a job without risk. It's a, a very uh, a fragile suit system that you're, you're wearing. It's uh, 13 layers of material, a very thin uh, layer of glass between you and the vacuum of space. We were out uh, outside of the Mir space station to recover some experiments that uh, had been deployed uh, on an earlier flight. It's incredibly awkward. It's like 
trying to do brain surgery with a hockey mitt on. That's the way he's described it before. I hooked on my uh, safety tether reel and uh, started to move out to the sill of the, the orbiter's payload bay. My safety tether reel uh, failed to retract properly. The whole spacewalk was in jeopardy at that point. You always have to maintain a tether because if you don't, you can float loose and could literally be lost in space. My wife was actually uh, one of my friends and colleagues uh, called her for mission control. I was at home, I had Luke and he was at um, 15 months or so and um, they called right away and said, you know, if you're watching it, this is what's going on. And then I think she uh, probably got a little bit nervous. This happened to be one of those things that no one had ever thought would fail. The very first thing I thought of is perhaps the spring mechanism had frozen up and so I tried to tap it as any, any person would. I tried to pull out a little bit uh, more of the cable. I tried to feed it back in. I had two waist tethers about uh, three feet long a piece and I'd clip one in, move a few feet, clip in the next one and kind of scale the, uh, the outside of the Mir space station. And it saved the spacewalk. That was just Crazy. awesome. My third flight was STS-95 in 1998. That flight was uh, quite well attended at the launch. We had President Clinton uh, and his wife there, uh, not necessarily to see me. In fact, I know he wasn't there to see me. He was there to see uh, John Glenoff. It was a real treat to fly with John for a number of reasons. Firstly, because he was uh, one of my role models as a, as a boy. I would have never imagined uh, growing up, becoming an astronaut in the first place, and then flying with uh, uh, the same role model. Yeah, there really is no average day in space, but uh, other than to say that they're all wonderful, they're all incredibly beautiful, and all very, very busy. There's a, an incredible sense of awe. I remember my very first uh, glimpse of the full curvature of the Earth as we unstrapped after my, my first launch. In fact, when we're in orbit, we're in free fall as if you were to jump off a, a cliff that is endlessly high without wind, and now you're falling. You can see entire continents in a single glance. You can see uh, the northern and southern uh, lights as you fly through them. You can see it's uh, just an incredible experience to, to fly like Superman wherever you go. My third flight was STS-95 in uh, 1998. Also a very uh, well-known uh, flight. Uh, I like to call it the Scott Parazinski flight, but the rest of the world calls it the John Glenn flight. I told them I wasn't coming down there. I didn't want to be called Senator. I wanted to be called John. They called each other, Scott and, and uh, Kurt and Steve and, and uh, Pedro and Shockey. And, and uh, I'm John, and I'm a crew member here. And I'm expecting to, to uh, carry my load. I'm not here just to ride. He was uh, one of my role models as a, as a boy. I had the one flight on Project Mercury back and they made the first orbital flight back in uh, February 20th, 1962. I very much wanted to go back into space again. I was glad to be part of that crew. A wonderful experience to be a part of that uh, very complex science mission. We had over 80 different experiments on the flight. One of their experiments, in fact, was John Glenn to look at the aging astronaut in the human body and, in fact, what happens to your body when you're in space. John had a pretty tough time on the flight. If, if you really uh, look at it uh, critically, he had to wear all sorts of uh, medical gear at night. Scott's the easiest guy in the world to, to work with. So he's so friendly and, and so knowledgeable. Uh, he was doctor for the whole crew, but uh, to me, he was a very special doctor. If something bad happened to me up there because of my age, he'd be the one that would have to take some action on it. Uh, every day, I would come after him with needles. Uh, looking for his blood. Oh, Scott drew blood so many times up there. I was like vampire. Every time I saw him, I thought his fangs were coming out and his hair was going long. <laughs> the experience was wonderful because he was so down to earth. Scott's capable. He's a, one of the most capable people I, I, I think I know. He really is just a sort of a renaissance type guy and very nice along with it. I'm very fortunate to have a wonderful family that's always supported me, encouraged me, uh, nurtured me and mentored me along the way and I certainly owe a lot to them uh, for being able to stand here today as an astronaut. The kids are the center of my universe. Luke and uh, Scott love to go on big adventures, they call it. It's really funny because Luke started going um, 
rock climbing when he was two and a half. Someday, if uh, I get permission from my wife, I'd like to <laughs> give a shot uh, at Everest as well. When I met him, I thought, okay, once he goes up into space, then he'll, he'll get that, you know, kind of out of his system and life will kind of settle down. And it doesn't ever settle down with Scott. I hope that uh, when my days are done that I'll, I'll have uh, earned the oxygen that I breathed. You know, I, I would have left something significant contributed in some way to our knowledge, uh, to improving the quality of life for, for not just my own personal self or my family, but for everyone. Range is throttling down now.